Hi, geography students. This is Mrs. Wildy. We're going to be doing a video lecture over Chapter 13, The Human Environment. We do want to talk a little bit about how the Earth is impacting um, or has been impacted over time. So we talk first about uh, Alfred Wegener and his theory of continent, continental drift, where he says that our, our land are on top of plates, and those plates are shifting and moving and pushing up on each other and all those things. that They used to be all together as one supercontinent of Pangaea, but again, that was before humans um, started living on this earth. Um, but those those plates are still affecting us today because of those movements that are happening. Um, earthquakes and volcanoes are oftentimes along plate boundaries. Um, specifically, we have the Ring of Fire in the Pacific Ocean where you have a large number of earthquakes and, and volcanoes are, that, that affect the people that live around here. Again, here's California. That would make sense that that's going to impact um, the people there as they are a part of the Ring of Fire. Um, one example in the book they talk about uh, is the tsunami, which is caused, a large wave that is caused by an underwater earthquake. So in 2004, there was a massive earthquake under the Indian Ocean, and it affected not just India, but also places in Southeast Asia, like Indonesia, um, places in Africa, where not only did you have a large number of people that died, but also you have um, loss of agricultural land, loss of homes, businesses, destruction to the environment. And because of globalization, that has affected multiple places all over the world. Coffee prices went on the rise because Indonesia could no longer supply people in core countries or other places of the world with their coffee. Um, so again, because of the event may have affected more on a local area of the world, it really was a global event. We all felt the the feeling, the, the effects of it. Back to the history of the Earth, it's important to make sure we understand that there are epochs, and each epoch has periods of cold and periods of warm. So the current epoch that we're in is the Pleistocene, um, and the Pleistocene has seen areas of, of again, glaciations where it gets very cold and interglaciations where it's warmer. Obviously right now we're in an interglaciation. The last um, major ice age that you might know of would be the Wisconsin and glaciation. That was during the Pleistocene. Um, Mount Toba erupted 73,500 years ago and that shifted um, the global change um, and it affected the land usable by humans and animals and migrations of animals um, certainly had a, a massive impact on the earth. In terms of the current interglaciation we, we're in, we call that the Holocene. Um, but we have had, within the Holocene, we've had sort of a little ice age, meaning we had a little period of glaciation. It began in the early 17, I mean, uh, 1300, excuse me. Um, and we had you know, much colder temperatures, less rain, there were droughts all over the world, it impacted um, migrations of people, it impacted uh, exploration, it impacted agricultural use. We think that the Jamestown colony collapsed purely because of the seven-year drought as a, as a result of the Little Ice Age. And the event that really stopped the Little Ice Age was the eruption of the Tambora volcano, which again changed the climate and put an end to the Little Ice Age. So again, we're going to move into sort of the rest of the chapter being how humans have impacted the environment and what they're doing about it. So because of our population growth, we've had a huge impact on our environment over time. We are, of course, using up more land than we used to just for our population, but we're then impacting the, the natural environment on that land. So we cut down forests, we emit pollutants, we spill oil, we a bury toxic waste in our land, we dump garbage in the ocean, we do all sorts of things that alter our environment. One of the things that humans have done, unfortunately, very, very quickly, and it's having a major effect on the people that live there, is the RLC, the drying up of the RLC between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Mostly from human interference, humans are using chemical pesticides on the land around it, which has created um, uh, soil degradation and also desertification. So what used to be a lake essentially used for farming can no longer be used very much. It's, it's, it's been shrunk significantly in the last 25 years. And you can see the difference from these pictures in 1960 on the left versus the 2000s. That's not something we've been able to solve either. It's still a problem. At, at some point in the near future, we will not have an RLC at all. 
So water shortages is certainly an issue. We know that we have the hydrologic cycle, which I'll talk about in just a second, um, in terms of this idea of um, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, constantly going through water, constantly going through this process, which means that we always have that process occurring, giving us water, but the problem is that we are polluting that water. We are making it very difficult for the water when it when it comes down as rain or snow. Um, that precipitation is not able to get back into the land, maybe because we've built too much concrete cities and so it doesn't it doesn't get it back into the land the way it should um, and there's really no way to increase the amount of water that we need especially fresh water the hydrologic cycle doesn't make more water it just re you know takes the same amount of water and puts it through the cycle we unfortunately have a growing population that needs more water we're industrializing more so these agricultural industrial uses are using up our water very very rapidly um, we in turn have conflicts that re result from it. We have wars um, on the international scale and we have droughts and, and legal issues that arise between neighboring states, for example. There are ways that, that people can try and keep the water contained. Um, and again, they can pass laws that say you can only use water on certain days, but it is creating a problem. On the international scale, it's actually gone to war. So the Jordan River flows between Jordan and Israel and it's creating conflict not only between those countries, but also neighboring countries like Syria and Lebanon, and again within Israel itself, between the Palestinians and the and the um, Jewish Israelis, fighting over the river, um, especially those going into the West Bank, which is typically a um, Palestinian territory. Um, we also impact the environment from in terms of our air, so we're polluting our air more than we ever have before. Uh, we have more. Um, issue with volcanic dust getting into the atmosphere that changes our um, uh, environment and our atmosphere. We have more greenhouse gases that are being um, produced. These are CO2 or carbon, di carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. All of those contribute to the warming of our atmosphere as well. And in turn also part play a part in creating acid rain, both not good for us. Um, we are causing more deforestation, um, soil erosion, desertification, like I talked about with the RLC. Um, it's important to understand that our forests create a balance between our carbon and oxygen cycles. And when we, when we cut down all these trees, we have affected our oxygen cycle, which again means we don't have enough oxygen to breathe. Soil erosion has also created um, uh, less land that can support forests, less land to support agriculture. Um, it can lead to desertification where we don't aren't able to farm on it at all. Um, and again, as a growing population, we're using more toxic waste, radioactive waste, and we don't know how to transport it or how to dispose of it, where to store it, all of those things. This is a, um, a road in Brazil shown um, how we have destroyed the, land, the rainforest there. Oftentimes it's important to remember it's not just to create roads, it may also be to create land for ranching, for grazing livestock. And those cows are, you know, a major part of our diet in the world, and so we're needing to have more land for the cows, which means we tend to cut down the trees so that they have room to do that. Um, this is a picture in China where you had terraced farming, where you have the, the steps along the side of the mountain where you can farm on it. But as soil erosion has occurred, it has collapsed that farming system, that terraced system, and so you can't use it for farm, and the people have lost their livelihood and food. We also are impacting our environment through the loss of biodiversity. We have less species now than we have in the past. We're losing... Um, ability to research possible cures for for diseases those are found in our in our plants and our animals perhaps finding out how animals survive can help us learn how to survive but if we're getting rid of those species that's we're losing those those opportunities um, the other thing contributing to environmental change um, are our laws and that means not just on a local scale, but also on a global scale. So we can make changes on a local scale in terms of what Gwinnett County can do or what Georgia can do. We can even make changes in terms of what the U.S. will or will not do in terms of our environment. But it's important to make sure it's not enough for just the United States to make changes. The whole world has to make changes. But we have issues related to whether or not core countries, which are contributing more 
um, to the environmental change, whether they should contribute more to saving it, or whether it should be equal on all sides. That's sort of debatable. Um, a lot of people think that the poor, um, poorer regions where there's larger numbers of people um, might be degrading the land more. In turn, in turn, this this study has said that really they're not. They're probably being actually better using more organic matter because they can't afford the chemical pesticides pesticides that de that deplete the um, the soil de soil grade and they create desertification. So um, in terms of contributing to environmental change, the population is the biggest one. It's also important when we talk about natural disasters to to look at the discrepancy we have between core and peripheral countries. Peripheral countries are going to see not just economic loss from a natural disaster, they're going to lose their homes, their businesses, the land will be, will be destroyed, but they're also going to have higher mortality loss. So people are going to die in greater numbers. A lot of times peripheral countries do not have adequate housing for um, to withstand earthquakes or tsunamis or those kind of things. Whereas in core countries, they're going to only have the economic loss. There may be a few people that die, but it's not going to be in large numbers. Whereas um, for the poor country, they have both the mortality and the economic loss. We're also contributing more to environmental change because of the technologies we're using. A lot of our technology uses fossil fuels like oil, um, those are non-renewable. They're not going to come back. Um, and oil, exam for example, we're probably going to run out at, at it within the excuse me, run out of it in the next 100 years because of the um, rate of consumption that we're doing. U.S. is very much at the forefront of, of, of consumption. Um, uh, we also have more um, likelihood of, of oil spills and oil slicks as a result of it, which is also bad for the environment. Um, our carbon dioxide use is going up as a result of our um, emissions from fossil fuels. Um, we are looking at alternate energy sources, but oftentimes these are more expensive and harder to implement in um, core countries or even peripheral countries um, because of the amount of industry and how industries would have to change so much in order to really make it worthwhile. Um, in terms of international organizations, I really think it's important that you know um, uh, the idea that there are international organizations trying to do things for the environment. It's harder for them to do things in, in smaller, you know, peripheral countries um, because the infrastructure is not there, the economic stability is not there. Um, they are trying to do things, but again, it's harder to implement it on, a na on an international scale. I want you to recognize these, um, these organizations or these uh, I guess, plans. So the GEF is the Global Environmental Facility. They um, really target these six issues that are on, on the screen. They've done a whole lot for trying to help the world in general, trying to, you know, make people aware of, of loss of biodiversity and climate change. They want to um, uh, help protect the ozone layer, help protect the land and from soil erosion and degradation. It's also, um, I also want you to know about the Vienna Convention for the Protection of the Ozone Layer and the Montreal Protocol. Those are hand in hand, um, went, went together. The first one was Vienna and then Montreal. And Montreal Protocol um, was very much an instrumental in stopping the use of CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, which are found in things like fire, they were found in fire extinguishers and hairsprays and aerosol cans. And they were the, were the precipitating factor that caused the hole in the ozone layer. So when we stopped using those, we saw a decrease in the, in the ozone hole, uh, the hole in the ozone layer. Um, in terms of CO2 emissions, it's the Kyoto Protocol, you should know. Um, in, and it was, again, an international attempt to stop um, CO2 emissions or lower CO2 emissions. Um, fortunately, the United States and China have refused to sign it and join it. Um, and those are both two countries contributing to, to CO2 emissions. Um, they're the two highest contributors of CO2 emissions. So um, anyway, that's something that we need to consider for the future. Um, I hope that this has been helpful for understanding Chapter 13 and the environment. Thanks so much.